Hey folks, welcome to Embalming One. We're going to start with Chapter One and work our way through Chapter Ten. But the first part of our embalming course is here at Miami Dade College. So this is Professor Finn, and let's get this started. So within the United States, we have two bodies that regulate. We have the states, okay, and within the states we have death certificate registration, paperwork, bureaucracy, and that differs from state to state. Generally, uh, most states, at some point, we are under the umbrella of the Department of Health here in Florida under the Bureau of Vital Statistics. Uh, licensing authority, well, again, that differs from state to state. Uh, here in the state of Florida, uh, the Department of Financial Services, Division of Cemetery, Funeral, and Consumer Services is our licensing authority. Uh, at one point, we're under the Division of Business and Professional Regulation. Different states put this in different places. And these enforce statutory laws, uh, statutory laws as well as rules governing the disposition of dead human bodies for the state of Florida. At the national level, we have a bunch of different agencies, many of which we will study within the context of embalming and some even outside um, in different subjects like funeral law. So we have the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which loosely regulates what we do in case of epidemic disease. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, which again can affect what we do, but that is, um, for the most part, something rare. This has a lot to do more with crematories and disposal of stuff rather than it does for us in our day-to-day -day operation. But the Federal Trade Commission and Occupational Safety and Health Administration most certainly affect us on our daily, um, daily walks through life in the funeral industry. So law is the minimum ethic of a community. The community places trust and confidence in certain persons to fulfill their wishes and desires in a competent manner. Certain standards are expected and demanded from funeral directors and embalmers. And you're going to see a lot more of that when you study uh, your funeral law because that is where a lot of, of that is more evident. When you're issued a license, it basically declares the following items. Um, bombing is a practice that affects public health and safety, so it's regulation and control is a matter of public concern. Uh, practice by merits and receives confidence of the public, so only people who are trained in it should probably do it. Care of the deceased is something that is um, universal for all humankind. And obviously, whatever codes and laws are in place, states should probably construe them liberally um, so that it affects the widest amount of people in the best possible way. So reverence for the dead is our basic ethical axiom of the funeral profession. Preparation of the dead is humankind's means of ethically fulfilling an ancient emotive instinct to care for our dead. And we are charged as funeral service practitioners with maintaining this moral and ethical responsibility. All of you need to buy into this. You know, reverence for the dead, taking care of the dead is something that should be very, very important and dear to you. And for the people that it isn't, we read about them on the news where they cremate the wrong body, embalm the wrong body, stuff a body full of newspaper and then try to pass it off as guts and blame it on you know, someone else not giving it to them. That's not reverence for the dead. That's just downright disrespect to the dead and being shady in your business practices. Every profession and every professional has a primary and supreme ethic of importance for its duty. So medicine, uh, we have the Hippocratic Oath. Law bases its ethic on justice, and we have our reverence of the dead. Our Western culture, United States, North America, whatever, has an attitude of denial and defiance towards death and dying, want to stay young and lovely forever. And Americans in general, we kind of, you know, are the apex of that. We value bright and shiny. We devalue dull and old. Um, death symbolizes what we fear the most, psychological and eth ethical paradox. We are both attracted to and repulsed by the dead. The dead represent defeat and despair we're going to lose. Um, we develop as humans elaborate barriers to cope with that. And we teach thanato thanatology to kind of educate you so you can help people overcome it and overcome it for yourself. Reverence for the dead is deeply ingrained in human nature. There's no amount of stupidity, apathy, ignorance, disgust can change that. Even Neanderthal, 60,000 years ago, had a reverence for the dead. So what happens when we do something, you know, in derogation to reverence of the dead? Well, it's historically and statistically quantifiable to the decline of government and sociological order. As we stop caring about the dead, our own society crumbles because we are that far gone. So ancient Rome, ancient Greece, Nazi Germany, the three examples in the book, uh, British Prime Minister William Gladstone has this very nice phrase, show me the manner in which a nation or community cares for its dead, and I will measure with mathematical exactness the tender sympathies of its people 
their respect for the laws of the land, and their loyalty to high ideals. All world cultures have developed their own rituals for the dispositions and proper care of the deceased. It's why we teach another course called Funeral Directing. Anthropological, archaeological, and even religious literature all prove the importance to a culture's chosen form of funeralization ceremonies. This also signifies the presence of the dead body in helping the community overcome the experience of death. In reference to reverential care of the dead, we have a conflict between logic and emotion. Logic might well dismiss the corpse as a mass of dead tissue. It's just meat. Get rid of it. Emotion might well have a problem with that, but that's still dad's meat. This conflict shocks us into listening to our deepest emotions to avoid falling to a trap of rationalization and denial, which we then continue, which is very unhealthy for us mentally. In 1963, Jessica Mitford attacked the funeral industry with her book, The American Way of Death, and it didn't really matter because John F. Kennedy was shot that year, and all over America, people broke down crying. They were shattered the death of Ameri one of America's probably most socially popular presidents. We also then, you know, in our various circles, we mourned people like Martin Luther King, Pope John Paul II, Michael Jackson, Princess Diana. Uh, there's been a bevy of people in the year 2015 and 16 who have passed away that are famous celebrities or politicians, and there are generally outpouring from the community and the nation at large for them. And all of these represent our instinct to want to care for the dead and care about people. Thousands of dollars are spent each year in recovery efforts for dead or missing soldiers. And from a strictly logical standpoint, why care? You know, what does it matter? Well, it matters. No person left behind. That is very, very important for a lot of people. For centuries, the funeral was essentially a religious ritual. So, convictions are important to the embalmer. If you look at the Christian Bible, there's a reference to embalming in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Christian Bible. In the New Testament, there is evidence of bathing, anointing the body with oils and spices, shrouding, and then placement in the grave. And that's because Jewish tradition did not want to have the influx of pagan treatment of the body from the Egyptians. The Romans burned their dead. So, it just kind of is what it is. But the Romans definitely picked up some Egyptian stuff along the way because it was cool. Reverence of the dead is expressed through the consistent application and practice of showing respect and honor for the dead. Human beings are inherently social creatures, and the quality of attachment to others varies from one relationship to the next. We can care more about friends and some family members. We can put family above all else, etc., 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 Deep links or attachments are strong and profound, psychological bonds that are extremely powerful, okay? And we can form those with just about anybody. Sometimes we're actually unaware of how powerful those links are until they are severed by death or physical emotional distance. Someone goes away, far away, you don't see them, you see them on a daily basis, and generally you find out that you actually miss them more than you thought you might. It is important that humans have this capacity as this is our basis for the emotion of love. So there are some definitions, okay, you need to look at, imprint or imprinting versus body image, um, those would be important. Death brings a finality that challenges our means to psychologically um, process what's going on. We thought what was infinite is now temporal and finite. We're forced with the fact that people die. Honest confirmation of the reality of death requires mourners to see the deceased or symbol of the deceased, see the casket, see the urn. And the best way to overcome death denial is to view or touch the body. That is insanely important. Every grief therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, they all universally agree that the best way to overcome death denial is to view or touch the body. Because then you can no longer deny it. You're forced to it. The comprehension of human separation can never be accomplished through intelligent rationalization. You cannot convince yourself. Okay? You cannot do it. That is what this is saying. Seeing, touching matters. Not in your book. The study has proven that the dreams of individuals who have not viewed a dead body or have a poor body image of the deceased due to trauma are more frightening than those who have viewed the body after embalming at rest. That actually helps them kind of cope and go. 
There's also other literature out there. Some of you might say that say that seeing the body in a resting or sleeping state uh, is death denial in and of itself. But it's, in my opinion, still better than not seeing it at all. Establishing the reality of the death is always more of a need than a want. We might not want to see the body, but our inherent need to accept and make it concrete beats out. Erich Lindemann confirms this according to your text. Dr. Lindemann believed that the most significant benefit of funeralization and embalming is achieved at that moment when the finality of the death is fully comprehended by the bereaved person. It is the moment of truth, this awareness of the reality of death that serves as the psychological framework for the validation of embalming. Dr. Carl Jung, a pioneer in psychology, saw human psychological life as a universal, universal phenomenon where identification with what he termed the collective unconscious linked all humanity together. To fully implement the ethical, psychological, and sociological values of funeralization, people need time. Time to organize, time to think, time to participate. Time to make the right decisions, time to assimilate what they have been through, and time to assimilate the fact that a person has died. Embalming can serve the practical need to allow the body to be transported over distances, to be held until decisions are made. So embalming helps all of these things right here. In the United States, embalmers, not funeral directors, okay? Very important right now you accept that there are differences in licenses. Funeral directors do one thing, embalmers do something else. Some states have a combination license that lets you do both, which many people obtain. But if you are licensed as one and not the other, you cannot do the job duties of the others who do not fall into the trap of funeral directors embalm bodies. They do not. They run funerals. Embalmers run bodies, embalm bodies. Funeral directors run funerals. Combination licensees do both. Ethics is a science of rectitude and duty whose subject is morality. That's pretty poetic. A set of principles that governs conduct for the purpose of establishing harmony in all human relations. In absence of a specific set of rules by which to govern, society turns toward traditional customs and practices. No code can specify all the duties of the embalmer in every circumstance around the world. They can only serve as guides where neither tradition or custom have provided a standard of practice. We should also provide judicious counsel. Our experience and what we do and how long and how often we have done it qualifies us, qualifies us as embalmers to be of great value to the people that we serve as our clients, our friends, and our extended families. Embalmers should be able to advise families accordingly with decisions regarding viewing, restoration, uh, necessary invasive procedures or the need for available photos to qualify restorative work. Always communicate realistic expectations. You should also encourage any family wanting to donate organs, body donation, or autopsies to determine maybe actual cause of death or actual prognosis of disease. Always support their wishes in this and all other areas. Just because it makes your life harder, more time to embalm, and we will study uh, later on in the book about restoring donation cases and autopsy cases. It's, it's time. It's a lot of time. But that is not a reason for you to say, no, don't do it, because you don't want to spend the time. The embalmer shares with all medical and hospital personnel the professional responsibility of cooperating with all groups and in supporting all measures promote health, safety, and public welfare. Courtesy, tact, discretion should characterize all of the embalmer's professional actions. And as a licensee, you should never aid or abet unlicensed activity, period. You run the risk of losing your license permanently. You run the risk of severe fines, all sorts of good stuff that you just do not want to get into. You also will probably get some information that you should never disclose to anyone else. So being able to keep the family's confidence, keep discretion is important. Don't even share it around the office. Comments regarding other funeral professionals should be always selected with care. You shouldn't be talking smack about the other people or other firms or whether they're corporate or family-based. 
Do not insinuate, overplay the reality, or make non-factual statements about another professional, even if it's the truth. Be better than that. It is also unethical to solicit another employee of another firm for the purpose of just screwing with the firm, okay? Hampering, injuring, prejudicing the other firm. Now, you want to try to help a person out and let them know that there are some vacancies available because they're getting treated like a dog? Hey, do what you got to do. But just so you can screw with the other firm is not acceptable, okay? Not every family may wish or be able to afford a visitation with viewing. but may wish to view the remains in a preparation room, whatever. Uh, to the extent possible, within good morals and good business sense, we should accommodate that request as professionally as possible. It is your responsibility, period, to make sure that who you are embalming or disposing of is who they are. IDing a body is an absolute given. You're also duty-bound and legally responsible to ensure that all legal requirements of federal, state, and local government are being met in the practice of your business. You also have a moral and ethical responsibility to assure that you receive whatever training is required to maintain your license. So you have a moral and ethical responsibility and even a legal responsibility because if you say, yeah, I've done it and you haven't, I promise you the state's going to be a little, be a little upset with you, okay? to maintain your license and remain good at what you do. It gets boring sometimes, but you do what you've got to do. Embalmers are ethically responsible for protecting the health of any person allowed to enter the prep room for any reason and restricting entry for those who should not be there at all. Embalmers should always practice safe sheltering to ensure that any deceased under their care would not be viewed or harmed by those who should not have access. It is not just the responsibility of the owner. It is not just the responsibility of other staff members. You share in that responsibility, especially if you are the one who left the door unlocked or ajar. Always deliver and document quality care of the deceased body. Embalming reports, property tracking reports, and written permission to embalm are all necessary. Get them, keep them, and ensure you don't lose them. All movement of the deceased from the removal and casketing and funeralization should be done in a respectful manner. All your equipment should be clean. Remains should be protected by wrapping, dressing, or casketing. And personnel should always be dressed appropriately for their job function. You don't want some people in shorts and a tank top walking ca a casket through your funeral home. It's bad business. Embalming definitely is an art as much as it is a science. The successful embalmer must have occupational leeway to do their job to take additional time whenever necessary to do the job right. Quality over quantity. Quality over quantity. If you need the extra half and able to get it. Okay? That's why many embalmers are put on salary. Okay? Any licensee who's basically screwing up should be disciplined by the observer or their superior. There is no place for unethical behavior. There is no place for uncorrected behavior. If you see someone doing something wrong, try to fix it. If you don't feel like fixing it, tell someone who will try to fix it. We work with coroners and medical examiners to ensure that all laws are being complied with. It is important that we communicate with them if we notice anything that might fall under their jurisdiction. Accidental death, homicide, suicide, death in apparent good health, a dirty dozen are all cases for the coroner or medical examiner. This is going to be covered at length in funeral law class. I'm not going to beat it to death now. We'll actually talk a little bit more about it in another chapter within the book. All forms in the book are generic. They're for reference only. Uh, forms and procedures are covered in other classes. I'm not going to discuss the forms, but you should look them over and see what's on there um, just to get an idea of what you should be asking. So forms of specific interest to you as an embalmer, death certificates, permission to embalm, property tracking sheets, written authorization for the extra stuff you might have to do, tissue organ donation, and custody of remains. So death certificates, um, some states you require an embalmer's affidavit on a death certificate. You know, it would be nice to get a death certificate that gives us a cause of death or, you know, whatnot so that we can kind of maybe plan out our embalming analysis accordingly. Of course, you shouldn't do anything without a permission to embalm. You know, oral permission uh, at the time of removal is okay, but written permission as soon as you meet with the family is very important. You do need to get written permission eventually. 
Property tracking sheets. Oh, yeah, you want to make sure that what's supposed to be with the body is with the body. Uh, other written permission, if you need to do some crazy stuff, and you'll learn about the different crazy things you might have to do as we go through the course. Tissue organ donation forms, that would be important. Um, someone comes in and wants to do a procurement, you want to make sure they have permission to do it. And custody of remains, well, that's obvious. You want to make sure that you actually can have custody of the body and you are entitled to it. Be aware. It's important as an embalmer to be very much aware, very much aware of what the laws are in your state regarding your practice. There are two main organizations that govern the industry. The Federal Trade Commission, okay, which created a rule in 1984 regarding pricing. It was amended in 1994, and it applies to all states. The federal law, of course, um, preempt state law, unless the state law is more strict. And many states are more strict. Um, there is verbatim wording that must be on every statement of goods and services and or permission to embalm uh, as a result of this legislation at the national and state level. Give you an idea, I give you a statement of goods and services from my previous employer. This is just a generic sheet with nothing on there. All the stuff in yellow is regulated by said Federal Trade Commission. Everything in there has to be where it is, in those words, etc. So that should give you an idea that the form pretty much matters. And I give you some of the phrasing, some of the phrasing right from the complying with the FTC rule. You can go to ftc.gov and type in funeral rule and find documentation. It's also in the online component to this class. We're going to beat up OSHA later, so we'll discuss OSHA then. And folks, welcome to Embalming One. We'll see you in the next lecture.